and welcome back to the CSS podcast. I'm very excited to dive into today's topic, which is scroll-driven animations. There are so many cool scroll-based experiences that you can build on the web, and the new scroll-driven animations API makes it much easier and more performant to do so. You might already be thinking of scrolly telling experiences as an example of scroll-driven animations that you've seen online, like flashy marketing pages, but scroll-driven animations can also be used for things as practical as header animations or sliding a navigation bar in as you scroll down the page. So as in our last episode, we have Brahmas Van Dam here to talk to you Ooh, all about scroll driven animations. Hey, hey, Hello, Brahmas. How y'all doing? Well, Thanks again for having welcome me. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> it was great. I loved recording with you last episode. So one, we we're like, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, so excited to be here as well. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about scroll-driven animations. Well, as you might have guessed from the name, scroll-driven animations are animations driven by scroll. And the <laughs> typical way that you... Yeah, whoa. <laughs> and the typical way that you you would do that is you were to use JavaScript, right? You would set up a scroll listener event somewhere and then hook up a call back to map the scroll progress to the animation progress. So you're reading the, the offset top from the scroller and... Uh, that's not good. It's not good. I always think about it like Java, JavaScript shows up late to the party, right? Like someone already came through, put all the chairs and all the food in a position and JavaScript busted. Hey, where's everything at? Hey, what's your top? <laughs> what's your left? What's your... And they're like, we're about to start moving into the next. And you're like, oh, I don't care. Give me your positions. I'm about to move that and that and this. And you're like, where were you last frame when we all did that together? And JavaScript's like, I don't show up at that time. That's just not why I show up. <laughs> and then you have to give it all the information, which takes so long. All and then it has again. to apply the changes. And they have to send that back. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. AKA problem is those scripts run on the main thread. So it's subject to jank. JavaScript could even be busy while it's trying to do that. And it, and it can't handle all the work. Or another problem is you got to load up a big, huge library to try to make it performant where they're doing all these things to try to avoid as much as possible. Or you might even just need to learn a new way of animating things using some new object notation or something else that you're not maybe as familiar with as the CSS keyframes that we've come to know and love over the past 25 years or so. So yeah. JavaScript showing up late to the party. We don't want you here. <laughs> yeah, and this is where the scroll animations API comes into play because it can like solve all those problems because you don't need to learn anything new with the scroll driven animations API because they give you a set of features that integrate nicely with the CSS animations and the web animations API. And because of that integration, you don't have the jank problem because when animating a property that can be animated on the compositor, well, scroll-driven animations using the scroll-driven animations API, they will also benefit from that. Nice. And that's the kind of classic properties like scale, transform, opacity. And we have a case study of that, which we'll link in the show notes. Check out developer.chrome.com slash blog slash brog, brog. Uh, but it's <laughs> anyway, you'll see it. It's called scroll animation performance case study. Check it out. Yeah, so as a reminder, you, you you don't need to learn anything new here because like most typically you already know how to make a CSS animation. Um, and if not, I bet we have an episode on that, right? Somewhere a long time ago, maybe? We definitely talked about animations. And I really do love the API here because it feels like it makes so much sense. It is important to note that ScrollGen Animations has both a CSS and a JavaScript interface. But for the sake of the CSS podcast here, we're only going to be focusing on CSS. So we'll link to some more information about how to use JavaScript too to hook into scroll-driven animations. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll be focusing on CSS. Also note that this feature was initially covered in episode 16, which is way back in season two. We're in episode 90 now. So that was a while ago. <laughs> And this feature has evolved a lot since then. It looks very different now. Now we're talking about the stable shipped feature that has shipped in Chrome and other browsers are working on it. We'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But the API shape has gone through a big rewrite thanks to feedback from the community and from other spec editors. So it looks very different now and it works much better than it did. Yeah, I remember listening to uh, episode 16 back in the day. I wasn't even a Google employee back then. No way. Uh, but I did get name dropped in that uh, episode because I was experimenting with this API a lot before. And you picked up my demos and told the world like, hey, these are great demos by Ramis. And then, well, no, 
I'm here. <laughs> wow, look at us now. Look at you now, Brahmas. You're on the show. I love That's that. That's a rad full circle sort of scenario. I love it. I love that. Yeah. So um, just a quick recap of browser support. This feature shipped in Chrome 115, Chromium 115, so it's also in Edge. Firefox is also actively working on it. We've seen some commits there. And Safari is also publicly supportive of the API. So while it's not shipped in those other browsers yet, we hope to see it landing in the next few the months, hopefully, to years, but we we don't know what their roadmap looks like. Uh, luckily, there is a polyfill for this feature, so you can use the polyfill to support unsupported browsers because this isn't one of those features that you can easily progressive enhance with, and you're probably already using a JavaScript library to do this anyway, so you might as well get some of those performance benefits and DX benefits of using the native feature while we wait for full browser support. You can use it a little bit for progressive enhancement if it's things that aren't critical to to user journeys, like just having things kind of animate in nicely. If you scroll down a page, I think scrolly telling could be one of those things, but it really depends on your use case. So think about how this works for you. Keep in mind browser support and keep in mind there's a polyfill. Yeah, typically the, these are for animations that like aren't critical, but they really make the difference in the end. Like if you can add them, they give like this extra flair, this extra nice touch to your web page, and you're like, oh yeah. This is smooth. But if you don't have them, well, you can still submit the form and you can still click the link. So yeah, no harm there. So let's run a little bit back. Um, Scroll-driven animations, as I mentioned, you can complement these with CSS animations or the Web Animations API. And as you might know, uh, an animation by default runs on the document timeline. And that is a timeline that gets created when the page loads. So when, when the page loads, time is zero, and then it starts ticking forward every second. And we hook our animations onto that in CSS using properties like animation duration, animation delay. We are targeting that document timeline. Now enter the scroll timeline. That is a new type of timeline that tracks the scroller from start to finish. So when you're at the top of the scroller in, in one that scrolls uh, vertically, you're at 0% scroll progress. And when you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you are at 100% scroll progress. And then for a horizontal one, you are at 0% when at the left. And if you scroll all the way to the right, you end up at 100%. And this flips, by the way, for RTL languages and whatnot. So yeah. Sick. Um, yeah, so this scroll timeline, it tracks that scroller and you can use a type of timeline to drive your animation. So instead of saying like, hey, you should animate five seconds over like a time of five seconds, you can say, no, no, you should animate as you scroll from the start of the scroller to the very end of the scroller. And that creates a direct link between the scroll progression and the animation progress. So as you scroll up or down, the animation moves forwards and backwards in direct response. And that's a bit of a difference to so make here. Like you, you might think of scroll triggered animations. Well, those are a bit different because scroll triggered animations are time-based animations that trigger when you reach a certain scroll offset. So scroll driven is directly based on the progress of the scroll offset and scroll triggered is progress based on time, but triggered by crossing a scroll offset. So this only works at least right now based on the full duration of the scroller. So you can sort of scrub back and forth on that scroller and the animation will go forwards and backwards, right? Yeah. It kind of goes both ways. So that's pretty cool. You might have seen scroll triggered animations. I feel like that's more common on the web right now, probably because it's a lot easier to do on the web right now with JavaScript than real scroll driven animations. That's something that the team is working on next, not landed yet, but that is an effect that, as Brahma said, would use a timer. It would just use the scroll position to trigger it instead. So this is different. This is going to be fully scroll driven based on that scroll time. Oh man, it's so weird talking about time because it's not really time. <laughs> scroll position is really the scroll position from when you started to, to the end of the scroll. Yep, that's a really good point. And yeah, scroll triggered animations. It's funny because that's like JavaScript showing up to the party just once to be annoying, you know? So instead of like them showing up every frame, be like, hey, where's everything at? I need to move some stuff. It's like just a one time thing. So you're like, oh, we're limiting how annoying JavaScript is in this flow. And you've got a really good example on your website, Bramus, which I'm sure we'll cover more here in a second. But it's like a reading indicator that grows as you scroll down an article that you're reading. So it's like a, a red bar at the top that starts at zero. And then the goal is to have a bar be full width by the time you reach the bottom. 
And that's something you can very easily wire up with this new API. And I think that's a good intro scroll-driven animation. Yeah. I remember back in the day, I added this to my website, this feature. This was like 10 years ago. But the way that I did it was really awful. <laughs> I created a gradient uh, in CSS that essentially went from the top of the page to the bottom of the page to create a line, like think of like the top left corner to the bottom right corner, like some yeah, color. I remember that it created like that this was the trick. triangle thing. Yeah, and exactly. You, you clipped it or something like that. As so you it's scroll. a triangle and then you only show the bar at the top. So it looks oh. like there's progress moving because the background position is fixed. So as you scroll the page, the background, which takes up from the top to the bottom, stays, but you see more of the colored bar on the left versus the right like that triangle, it fill, sort of fake fills up yeah. the bar. Yeah, you, you could tell if you were on like on a short page, you could tell like the line was very slanted at the end, yeah. or if you were on a very <laughs> yeah. tall page, it was like almost upright. But yeah, you yeah. could tell it was a hack. Weird <laughs> hack, weird hack. Happy we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, not now. so now we, we no longer need hacks for that uh, because we can create these scroll timelines straight from within CSS. And for that, we have a new function, which is named scroll. And that's it. And that scroll function, if you do that, it will create a scroll timeline for you, which will track the nearest ancestor scroller in the block direction. Nice. And to use that, because like you can create it, but you also need to use it, right? So to attach that to our animation, uh, we have a new property, which is called animation-timeline. So to make an animation scroll driven, you can combine both and you're done. Uh, for example, if you have an animation somewhere that says uh, an animation a declaration that says slide one second linear forwards, you extend that by adding animation timeline. So a new declaration to that with the value of scroll to make it scroll driven and that's it. And if you want, you can drop the one second duration from the shorthand because seconds really no longer have a meaning here because you are using that scroll timeline. and. It's as easy as that. Yeah, you create your first scroll-driven animation by just adding the animation timeline declaration to it. Woohoo! Nice. It really is that easy. All your keyframes that you've ever written before are still valid. All you need to do is after you write your animation declaration, you add a new line and say animation timeline scroll. And it will find the nearest scroller. And as that vertical scroller is scrolled, it will power your animation. It's super cool. And you can configure this as well. So it accepts two arguments, this scroll function. I mean, what kind of function wouldn't take arguments anyway, right? So this one takes two. It takes an axis to determine which direction you want to track. So this is crucial because the default is Y. And if you want to change that, you're going to have to specify X and a scroller argument to determine which scroller. So in case the nearest scroller is going to be an issue for you, you can specify an exact one. So again, just on those accepted values for the axis argument, you can specify block or inline if you're working logically, Y or X. And this determines the axis that you want to track to progress your animation. The default, again, is block. And for the scroller, this one gets a little bit more complicated, but nearest is a keyword you can pass that uses the nearest ancestor scroll container. And that's the default we keep talking about. You can also specify root. So that's in case you have a scroller in a scroller and you actually want to track the primary document scroller, you can specify root. You can say self, which uses the element itself as the scroll container. Very cool and tricky. And of course, Bramus has your back here with... Scroll to animations dot style. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was Bramas waiting a... there for you to say it. I didn't want to say it first. <laughs> but no, Bramus has this great site and a bunch of tools on the site too. So it's scroll dash driven dash animations dot style. And one tool specifically here that helps you with understanding what nearest versus root versus self is, is this sort of scroll timeline parameters tool. And this I think it was really useful because it shows you what different animations actually do based on the scroller and the axis. So as an example here, with the scroller and a scroller, that's kind of what we see here. You have this inner scroller, outer scroller. When you have the scroller be the nearest scroller, you're looking at the ancestor, the nearest ancestor. So you have this like rainbow animation when you scroll the scroller that's outside of the smallest scroller. And nothing happens when you scroll the actual smallest scroller because you're looking for that ancestor. Um, and then when you have the root, you're looking at the page, like the root of the page itself. So you actually have a scroller and a scroller and a scroller in this example. Scroll um, Where you see this like animation. Yeah, scrollception. Uh, this animation happen when you are scrolling the, the page itself. And then there's finally self, which is applying the animation on the smallest baby scroller uh, that's inside of the other two scrollers because you're looking at itself for the scroller. And then of course, block and inline, this changes the direction. 
the directionality of the scroll that's then applying the animation. Really nice to see it just right in front of you. So again, check out scrolldrivenanimations.style where you'll get a bunch of resources here, demos and tools. And this will help you understand how all this fits together. There's not just this tool. There's also a little timeline range visualizer, a progress visualizer, a bunch of stuff that's really helpful. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cover these in a bit. Uh, let's bring back a little bit to the to the syntax. So Adam mentioned we have two arguments for this. We have the axis and the scroller. And the way that you pause these into the scroll function is by separating them by a space and the order doesn't matter there. Mm. So if you pass in uh, block, space, root, or root, space, block, that's basically the same. It doesn't really matter. And also since block is the default, well, you can omit it. So you can have, for example, scroll, open the parentheses, root and then close the parentheses and that will track the root scroller because you said so in the block direction because that one is the default now there's also like if you look at these values of all these scrollers like you're somewhat limited by it because you can only do nearest root or self but maybe like sometimes you want to track an element that is not the nearest one or not the root scroller or not the element itself like you, you want to track a scroller at the far end, way at the other side of the page. So for that, we have an alternative syntax where you can not create an anonymous scroll timeline with the scroll function, but you can create a named scroll timeline by giving it a name. And as you might have guessed it, maybe the property to do that in CSS is the scroll timeline name property. So that's scroll dash timeline dash name. And the value is the name that you want to give to that certain scroller's timeline. With the one caveat that it's a dashed ident, so it needs to start with two dashes. So for example, you can have scroll dash timeline dash name, colon, and then the value of dash dash my scroller. Nice, and this is kind of why we've been suggesting to just dash dash all your idents, so that way you don't have to try to remember which ones are dashed ident types and which are just types of ident. If you're just dash dashing all of them, it's glanceable, scrubbable, and you can just find these things nice and easy. But yeah. Yeah, like anchor names have to be a dashed ident. View transition names do not, yeah. but they can be. So just double dash all the things. Definitely something that we are all recommending now. Yeah, and it's also very easy to see at the gloss. You, you see that it has two dashes. I named that. It doesn't have two dashes. Oh, it's a keyword that the browser gave me, whatever. Yeah. Exactly. And then you could do dash dash auto. <laughs> Fun little side note here too. I was just pinging a uh, rule. Remember rule from CSS day? I was like, we need a dash dash ligature for CSS that turns the dash dash into something cooler. Like why is JavaScript <laughs> got to get all the cool ligatures? How about our variables that we reference all the time in CSS? Get this cool ligature in front of the variables. Hmm. Anyway, what would that look like? I don't know. That's why I sent it to him. I was like, do something cool. I don't know what it should be. <laughs> all right. I love it. We'll, we'll mull on it. We'll mull on it. <laughs> But then you can use that dashed ident as a value for animation timeline from before. We just talked about scroll timeline name. There's also animation timeline. So instead of animation timeline scroll, like the scroll function, you can do something like animation timeline dash dash my scroller. And then the former, it, this one is called an anonymous scroll timeline where you're using the scroll function. The latter one is a name scroll timeline because you gave it a name. Yeah, and the outcome of these can be the same. Like you you can give the nearest ancestor scroller a name and then use that name. So instead of using a scroll function, you can use the dashed ident. And I sometimes like to do this because it's more explicit. Like instead of having the browser figure out like, oh, what is the nearest scroller? I'm like, no, no, no. this is the one I've got it figured out for you. One downside with it though, is that the lookup mechanism from an element that uses a timeline as its animation timeline, the lookup only goes up the ancestor tree. So it goes from the, the element that is animating, it checks its parent, hey, do you have this name? Nope. It goes up to the next parent, hey, do you have this name? Nope. And so on and so on and so on until it ends up at the root. It's like container queries. So container queries have the same limitation, right? You can name it your container or you can just discover the nearest anonymous one. Okay, cool. So that I, I feel like it's almost always better to give things a name. Because uh, then you can ask for it directly or be anonymous and sort of get to be selective. 
Yeah, this, this kind of reminds me of Anchor, too. Like, there's different reasons for using something that's an explicit anchor versus an implicit anchor, where you might want to name it, you might not want to. So I think this is also similar, where you have these functional CSS components that you can string together, or you can name them and be more specific there. But I think Bramus is about to tell us that scroll-driven animations can get around it. Yeah. It's, it's not <laughs> limited like the other features Ooh. we're talking about. It's unbounded. Yeah, so so by default, it looks <laughs> up the DOM tree. It goes like through all the parents and say like, oh, do you have this name? But you can like create a shortcut. You can say like, hey, you know what? On a shared parent of the element that is animating and the element that is being tracked, you set a timeline scope property and you give it a value of that dashed ident. So for example, on the body element, you can say like timeline scope dash dash my scroller. And then the one scroller will create like a symlic type of thing to that one. And then the element that is animating, which is not a child of the scroller, can find it through that sim link. So you can like make links across your DOM from the one far end to the other. <laughs> yep. And I've used this. It's like a, I think it's a really good use case are the dots underneath the carousel because mm. they're not, yeah. they're not inside the scroller, right? They're like, they're living outside of the scroller, yet they want to represent what's going on inside of there. And so um, you mentioned sim link. I kind of think of about it like hoisting where the scroller uh, says, hey, I got a timeline scope. Here's the name of my scope. And then a parent element can register that same scope. And then you've got this these dots that can access it. So by allowing the scope of the scroller's name to kind of go up the tree, you then make it available to other branches that weren't otherwise in there. And it becomes invaluable when you have things not inside the scroller wanting to observe things of a scroller. Oh, yes, that's a really good example. Like when you're looking at one scroller, and using that to animate something else on the page. That's really complicated to do, and this API makes it really easy. Yeah, so um, in, in your example, Adam, um, you would use a timeline scope property. Um, but you don't necessarily need to use it on body or, or root, because like that's maybe a bit too broad, but you would use it on the shared ancestor of uh, the element that has the navigation dots and the element uh, that is a scroll that you want to track. And then you have the link uh, between both and yeah, <laughs> magic. <laughs> yeah, it's the car the carousel component itself is like holding on to the scope of its child scroller so that other elements, because you also have the next and previous buttons that need to know when you're at the end or beginning of the scroller. So you got buttons right. that need to animate based on scroll position and dots. And all of that can be contained inside of that carousel component. Yep. That's so nice. I love this ex like example of it because you might think, why not? But that makes so much sense. Um, so in addition to the scroll timeline name property, we also talked about axes. And so there's also a scroll timeline axis property, which accepts the same value as the axis argument of the scroll function. So you could think of this as like the longhand way to say this or the CSS -y way to say this instead of doing it in the function, which I imagine you'd want that axis to be in line for something like the carousel. So the values that you can get are X, Y, inline and block, with block being the default because the default scroll on a page is a block scroll. But if you're making any kind of component like that carousel, then you probably want to change that to inline. And if you want to declare both the name and the axis in one go, you also have a CSS shorthand, which is just scroll timeline. And this is the shorthand for the two long hands where you can put the scroll timeline name and scroll timeline axis. So you could have these sort of explicit names and axes in CSS instead of doing it inside of the scroll function. So lots of different ways to set up your scrollers and make it all connect. Totally. All right. Okay. So for the anonymous and named scroll timeline, we track the scroller from start to end, but sometimes you might want to attach your animation to only part of it. So like we've got an example where you track the scroller only from middle to the end, or maybe you only want the first few 150 pixels, like when you want to have your sticky header shrink into a smaller version. So it's attached to scroll directly, but only a portion of scroll. How do I do that, Bramus? Yeah, for that, we have a new CSS property, an extra one, which is called animation range. So that's animation dash range. And it's a property that accepts two lengths. So that can be pixel values, M's, percentages, viewport units, you name it, any length can fit in there. And the first value is the animation range start, which marks the scroll offset when the animation should start. And the second one is animation range end, which marks the scroll offset by which the animation needs to be finished. So in the shrinking header case, the value for animation dash range would be 0px space 150px. 
And as a result, that animation that is using that timeline will only be linked to that scroll distance of 150 pixels. So the animation will run from 0% to 100% over a shortened scroll distance of 150 pixels. Cool. Yeah, and the cool thing is that because it's a length, well, you can even do calculations with it. So say you want to run your animation from the middle uh, of the scroller to 200 pixels from the end. Well, you can set the animation range start to 50% but you set the animation range and to calc 100% minus 200 pixels. That all just works. Um, Why did I never think of this? That's brilliant. That Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's amazing. And if, if you if you can't follow here or if you want to actually see it like a visual, um, I have a demo for that. So the shrinking header demo, check it out in the show notes. Um, go to scroll-driven-animations.style, find it there, view source, or hit the little I icon at the bottom right, and you will get an explanation uh, of the code, uh, which we already just gave you here, like right now. But yeah. I smash that I icon so hard every time I'm looking at a demo. I'm like, teach me the ways. <laughs> <laughs> and you break it down all perfectly. I feel like like learning how to articulate animation ranges is the key to taking your scroll animations to the next level. And I have a quick little question for you. It's common for me to be like, I only want, like in the header example you shared, you used pixel values, 0 to 150 pixels. I've often done something like 5VH, mm -hmm. where I'm like, only for the 5 viewport height you know, range, which is kind of like the small percentage of the entire document run the animation. But then I'm like, okay, so then if I have nested scrollers, maybe container query units would be good because then it's contextual to the size of that container scroll area. But then I'm looking at these percentages and I'm like, maybe percentages means I don't have to care about VH, CQH or any type of like length unit that has to do with being in a, but the, I just get the, the, the difference. Is there yeah, a difference? There, there is a difference. So um, the viewport unit, so for example, viewport height or the container query height, that is the height of the scroll port. So that's uh, like the box oh, where you see yes. the content in. But 100% yeah, is not 100% of that box. 100% means when you have scrolled to the very bottom of that scroller. So yes, there is a difference. Um, great question there, yeah. Mm, that's good to know. Okay, cool. So there is value in viewport units for like your document animation ranges, container query units for your nested scroller animation ranges, and then percentages when you want to represent the entirety of the length of the thing that's being scrolled itself. The really long uh, or runway, as I like to call it, like the full <laughs> runway is your percentages. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you. That really clarifies uh, things for me. Appreciate that. Yeah. So something that I really struggled with too when I was first learning about scroll driven animations was the difference between this idea of scroll timeline, which we just covered, and a view timeline, because they seem so similar, but they're not. They're very, they're, they're similar but different and they have different use cases. So I definitely want to go over the differences between these. And so far we've been focusing on scroll timeline where you would track a scroller from start to end to drive the animation. So using that scroller. But sometimes you don't want to animate something the entire scroll progress timeline. That might be like a really long page and you just want to animate an element as it itself flies over the scroll port. So you want to focus on just the interaction when it enters the scroll port and right as it's about to leave the scroll port. So there's a different way to apply styling to this kind of interaction versus having to look at the entire viewport. And, and where this is really helpful is if you have things like images animating in and out or some like text animating in and out, you can apply these effects to like all the images in your page and you don't have to track the entire viewport height scroller where you'd have to know where each one is. So this is really helpful. And I, I want Brahmas to help explain this to, to the audience like he helped me understand it when I was first learning about this feature. So typically you, you would do that with an intersection observer if you know that you already have a head start here. Uh, but you can also use scroll driven animations for this because with that view timeline that you mentioned, you can track elements across the scroll port. So the full range of a scroll timeline is from the beginning to the end of the scroller. But for a view timeline, it's different. It's from the moment the tracked subject is entering the scroll port until it is leaving the scroll port. Wes Boss recently described this as, and also he said the word subject, but I like to think about it, but it's like each individual element. Because if you give the same animation of multiple elements, it will trigger as they themselves individually. And this is where uh, Wes said, first peeks its first little pixels head into, this, <laughs> into the viewport. <laughs> And then the animation ends right as it poops its last little pixel. 
And so that would be the entire range of a view timeline versus the scroll timeline being the entire runway of the scroller. But yeah, these are extra cool. They they come with some sort of like natural staggering and other cool things. So I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but <laughs> be excited for view timelines. They are super rad. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned that this gets applied to every match. So if you have like a view timeline uh, that is tracking 10 images, mm -hmm. each image will create its own view timeline and say like, oh no, I'm I'm crossing the scroll port. And then like 400 pixels down, the next image says, no, no I'm, I'm crossing, crossing the scroll port. port. So they, all, they each, yeah, they each get their own little view timeline. Here's my little <laughs> cute little pixel. There's my last little pixel. We Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one I think is really, really useful. And especially like when you first look at the API, it's just like view timeline, scroll timeline, but breaking them down and where they're used, very important. Yeah, so to create one of these, uh, well, <laughs> if we have scroll for the scroll timeline, then you might know what the, the function is for the view timeline. Take a guess. <laughs> is it view? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say something not view, just to like, but I was like, I can't come up with anything fast enough. Da. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just like the case with scroll. You got view and you can place it in the animation timeline property. So just like how you had an animation declaration that's like, here's my keyframes. Uh, you know, I don't care about duration anymore, but I do want it to be linear in both. You follow that up with animation timeline and you put the view function in there. And this one accepts only one argument, which is the access to track. And you can't define the scroller on it because it will always track the element you applied it to inside of its nearest scroll port. Yeah, and a typical situation where you would use it, and we've already mentioned this, is that where you want to decorate images so that they reveal themselves as they enter the scroll port and as they leave the scroll port. So for example, when they enter, you could do like a fade in, or like I did in one of my demos, I'm using a clip path and the keyframes to mimic like this revealing curtain effect. So the curtain opens up as the image is crossing the scroll port. And just like before, I can leave the existing animation shortened that I had in place and then add an extra declaration into the CSS rule, which says animation dash timeline with a value of view, which is the view function. So it's view, open parentheses, close parentheses. And each matched element will now reveal itself as it enters the scroll port until it has left the scroll port at the top. Yeah, and similar to the scroll function, if you want to name your timeline, there are the properties of view timeline access and view timeline name. So individually, you can use these CSS properties, and these values are pretty much the same as their scroll timeline counterparts, where you would set up a view timeline name, give it a double dash, dashed ident, and then view timeline access would be inline block or X or Y, uh, which tells the browser what directionality to look at. Yeah, and also similarly to scroll timelines is that with view timelines, you can attach an animation to only a sub part of the full range. So for example, you could attach an animation to the entry range so that it runs when the subject is entering the scroll port, or you could attach it to like the exit range, which is when the subject is leaving the scroll port. Yeah, and that's great for things like entry and exit effects, like, for example, a scrollable list where each item sort of fades in as it enters the scroller and then fades out again when it leaves the scroll port. On my site, I just have an entry effect where things kind of fade in and move in from the left, sort of like a little transition. And it's just a nice progressive enhancement because it kind of enhances the like little, oh, something is moving here, brings your eye to that part of the site, but it's definitely not necessary. But it's it's nice to use these for these little entry and exit effects. Yeah, so there's a bunch of ranges that you can target, uh, but before I go over all of them, I, I want to first mention that I have a built a tool to visualize these ranges. So you can find it over at, as you might have guessed, the scroll dash driven at animations.style. And there in the tools section, you will find a timeline ranges visualizer. So if you are listening to this with a computer nearby, it might be worth opening up the tool and following along because yeah, this will get complicated and the tool helps you understand everything. Yeah, it sounds simple like when we're talking about it, but once you go to build something, it gets really difficult. And yes, this tool is in valuable. I've built like 20 demos. I still use this tool almost every time just to hone in and just confirm and visualize what my mind's eye is trying to do. So it's a must visit and bookmark y'all. Seriously. Yes. Plus, plus one. 
So the default range here is cover range, which is the range uh, when the item is entering the scroll port until it's leaving the scroll port. The starting position is marked by an animation range at the position cover 0%. So that means 0% into the cover range. And then the end position is marked by I'm sure you could guess it, an animation range at cover 100%. So that is 100% into the cover range. And if you want to use these values in your CSS, uh, use the animation range property and set the value to cover space 0%, space cover, space 100%. But that's the default. You can change those values too. You can change the percentages. You could have it just enter and then apply some style at 25%. So it's just happening towards the bottom or at 50%. So just keep in mind that that's how these sort of cover range percentages work. Uh, for the entry and exit effects we just mentioned, you have different range names available. So the entry range is quite cleverly named entry and the exit range is named exit. So to animate something while it's entering, you would set the animation range to entry space 0% space entry space 100%. And for an exit animation, the value would become exit space 0% space exit space 100%. Yeah, and if you're targeting uh, 0% and 100% and the same ranges like in the start and in the end, you can simplify this to just exit, for example. So if you are targeting exit 0% to exit 100%, you can shorten this to only exit as the value for uh, animation dash range. Hot tip. Nice. Yeah, that is a hot tip. Finally, there's also a range for when the element is entirely within the scroll and the name for that range is contain. So cover is when it's about to enter and exit and then contain is when its startmost position is within that view. So its startmost position is contain 0% with the space in between. I'm not going to say it every time. Mm -hmm. Contain space 0% and the endmost position is contain 100%. Yeah, so to reiterate there, we have uh, four ranges that you can target, namely cover, entry, exit, and contain. And technically speaking, there are two more ranges, namely entry dash crossing and uh, exit dash crossing. But for smaller than scroll port subjects, these mean the same as entry and exit respectively. I won't dig into these right now because it would just confuse you a lot more than you most likely already are right now. <laughs> just use the tool, go use the tool, go look at the options. He's got them in a drop down, and then they're visualized and you can kind of see, oh, that's why entry crossing and exit crossing were a little kind of funny. Okay, so here's the part where it gets interesting. I mean, let's just be honest, it's been interesting <laughs> since the start, but you can mix and match range names and you can also play with the percentages. So again, this is like clamping the amount of time where the animation is going to occur to a certain and specific moment or area of that crossing of the scroll port. So for example, you have an animation range of cover 0%, cover 50%. That end range of cover 50% is midway between the cover zero and and 100%. So when this is applied, the animation will run from the moment the element is entering the scroll port and peeking its little pixel into the scroll port until it is positioned halfway through the scroll port, at which point it completes. Yeah, I use that approach for the revealing images effect. Again, the demo is on scroll-driven-animations.style because I want to fade in the image when it is entering the scroll port but I wanted it to be fully visible when it's like midway the screen and not when it has left the screen because that would be useless. So you could think of it as like a speeding up an animation because you manipulate the start and end offsets that determine when this animation should run from start to finish. Yeah, and also like Adam said, you can just mix and match the range names. So you're not bound to staying within one named range type. So for example, you could set the animation range start to entry 50% and the animation range end to exit 0% and it's perfectly fine. As long as the start range comes before the end range position, you're good. So you have to go start to end. Again, that tool, you can pop these values into the tool and see it visualized and then know what you're doing is totally, you're, you're like, why is my animation running? You're like, oh, because it's ended before it even started. Ah, thank you for the visual, Bramus. Yeah, yeah you, you want to know the reason why I built this? Because I was so confused at first when I started with uh, scroll-driven animation. I was like, why is this happening? Why is this not working? So I built a tool for myself and then realized, oh, this would help a lot of people. So yeah. It's public. Go check it out. That's the reason to build things. It, you help yourself. Yep. All right. By the way, did you realize some of these range offsets mark the same position? Like the position for the range exit 0%, for example, is exactly the same as contain 100%. 
Ah, it's that spot just before the element leaves the scroll port. So you got lots of options about how you articulate、mm-hmm. these things.、Mm. <laughs> also, remember that we were able to do calcs with the scroll、uh, timeline ranges. Well, you can do the same for view timelines. So where you see the percentages there, where you have like exit zero percent, exit one hundred percent, you can change those percentages by a calc for something. Yep, and I've used that before, where like I wanted an animation to run up to the point where it's thirty pixels from the Start edge of the scroller, and I could set that with a calc. I set the animation range end to exit minus thirty pixels. Ooh, so you can even go into negative values, just like negative durations and stuff.、Oh. Uh, so that way, it triggers thirty pixels from the edge, gives it a little bit of a head start or whatever. You can kind of time these things. Yeah, that's interesting. Or another one where you want the animation to end when the element had fully entered the scroll port plus one m, and so for that, you could set something like animation range end. To enter and use calc inside of that, and do calc 100% plus 1m. So you could do negative offsets, positive offsets. It's really, really fun. Lots. Of, I I just have never thought about using calc inside this. So it's like a fun thing to think about. Yeah, it's it's really powerful stuff. But I would I would suggest like start off with the percentages because, admittedly, this is confusing. And when once it clicks, you can like throwing some calcs in there.、Um, and again, if if you if you Couldn't follow here. No worries. There's a ranges visualizer tool up over at scroll dash driven dot animations.、Uh, scroll dash driven dash animations dot style. Go play with it. Hit some of the buttons. Change some of the options, and I'm sure we'll get the hang of it. Yeah, there's a bunch of controls on the right. Change the percentages and take the CSS. So just like Yuna's anchor tool, where I go there and click around and get to what I want, and then I just Steal that CSS right off the page. You can do the same thing on scroll-driven animations. Dot style. Click the clicks. It's always nice. You can copy <laughs> the CSS. So that was a lot of stuff.、Um, should we wrap things up here? Yeah, I think we should because we're already like more than half an hour in, <laughs> nearing forty、oh, well minutes. Well over. So, yeah, yeah. Well over half an hour. <laughs> Yeah, so、um, if you couldn't follow along here,、um, good news for you: there's basically only one thing that you need to remember from all this, and it's a URL, which is scroll-driven-animations.style.、Um, I didn't keep track of how many times we said it、uh, during this episode, so、uh, let's say it one more time: scroll-driven-animations.style. That's your one-stop shop. For everything about scroller animations, it has a bunch of demos which we didn't cover here in this episode, such as the cover flow recreations, columns that move in opposite directions, sections that scroll horizontally as you scroll vertically. Very weird, but very cool as well. <laughs>、um, a full car to sticky header, all great stuff that you can find on there. Yeah, when we talked about how each demo has like a little info icon at the bottom right, it's, this is going to trigger it's going to trigger a dialogue. <laughs> it's going to trigger a dialogue with an explanation of how it works, and you can also hit the switch icon to switch to, to like alternate versions. For example, like there's different approaches, or you can switch from the CSS to the JavaScript variants in case you wanted to, you know, just get a look at what's the JavaScript API like. Oh yeah, that's a good call too. Yeah. Since we didn't talk about JavaScript API in this show, check out scrolldrivenanimations.style, and you can see it on there. But also, Brahmas, didn't you make a video course all about scroll-driven animations too? That was going to be the next thing that I was going to mention. Like on the site, you can also find a link to a free video course. It's named "Unleash the Power of Scroll-Driven Animations." It's a ten-part course available on YouTube, and it teaches you all there is to know about scroll-driven animations in five episodes. And then it continues with five more episodes、um, that dissect some of the demos that I have created. I've poured my heart and soul into that one, so please check it out. Give it. A thumbs up if you like it, and I'm sure that once you have checked it out, you will be like the master of scroll-driven animations. It's so good, and it's really going to ramp you, you up. You too can be Brahmas. <laughs> Seriously, and these scroll-driven animations—they can really set you apart for just how things look. You know, they're off the main thread. So many times, people open up a demo and be like, "Sure, it looks good, but why is it so buttery?" And you're like, "Off the main thread." It really helps.、Yeah. Smooth, smooth, <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget. Also, I mean, Bramus has this covered in so many ways here, but there's an extension that you can add onto Chrome Dev Tools, and it allows you to visualize the ranges right there where you are while you're writing it, and it even updates as you scroll, so you can kind of see what you're building visually. Again, another invaluable tool to help you as you're creating these animations and these cool interactions.、Oh, yeah, good call on the Chrome Dev Tools extension. That is really nice little mini map visualizer. 
Yeah, and again, you can find the link on uh, the, your one-stop shop for scroll-driven animations, which is scroll-driven-animations.style. It's all on there. The demos, the information, the link to the documentation, the video course, and also this uh, DevTools extension that you can install into Chrome. Yeah, nice. Definitely check that out. It's a uh, real one-stop shop. I love, love to say that. <laughs> um, and thank you all for joining us on this show. This might be one of our longer shows for sure. Um, Ramis, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's so much information. And it's really good stuff too. It's a free, easy API to just get started with. I think some of the key concepts here are things like scroll timeline versus view timeline, um, understanding things like contain and cover versus entry and exit. Once you know some of these keywords, you essentially are just using this the same way that you do any other CSS animation. You just set up the timeline to be on a scroller instead. So definitely try it out yourself. It's a really neat feature that is a native part of the platform now. And I mean, I'm excited to see what y'all build with it. And thank you, Bramus, for joining us again, bringing the heat, bringing the data, bringing the tools, bringing the rad personality. And thanks again for having me. I enjoy doing this. this. This is great. This is fun. And for all you listeners out there, if you've got any CSS questions about scroll-driven animations, don't ask us. Yeah. Ask Bramus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah, just kidding. You can also ask this <laughs> hashtag CSS podcast. You know, one of us is going to pop up and be like, hello, how can I help you? If you want to find us on the internet, you can find me at at UNA. I'm at Argyle Link. And I'm at Bramus. Your question can help a lot of people, not just yourself, y'all. Think about others. Ask yeah, us stuff. ask us stuff. <laughs> and then we might make a show on it. And if you did like the show, also, please just give it a little review on whatever podcast app you're using. There's so many out there. Or share this podcast episode with a friend or a coworker. Or check out scrolldrivenanimations.style. Any of those things are going to help us out, make sure that we could keep making cool tools and creating little CSS podcast episodes for you. Thanks, y'all. We're looking forward to your questions. And we'll see you next time. And let's say it one more time. Scroll-driven-animations.style. Dash dash see ya. <laughs> Bye, everyone.